Welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast, your home for weekly information and inspiration to help you get the graduate job of your dreams. Welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast with your host, James Curran. The Graduate Job Podcast is your weekly home for all things related to helping you on your journey to finding that amazing job. Each week, I bring together the best minds in the industry, speaking to leading authors, entrepreneurs, coaches, and bloggers who bring decades of experience into a bite-sized weekly 30-minute show. Put simply, this is a show I wish I had a decade ago when I graduated. And this week on the Graduate Job Podcast for episode 52, I have some very special guests. Well, actually, I have a treat for you. I don't just have one special guest. I don't have two, not three. I've got nine. Yes, you heard me right. Nine brilliant guests. You see, today is episode 52, which means that over the previous 51 episodes, I've actually had 52 amazing guests. Now, each of my guests has been brilliant, insightful, witty, engaging. And if you've got a day and a half to spare, you can listen to all 36 hours of brilliant content. And naturally, I think this would be a wise use of your time. But I realize that that might not be realistic for all of you. Now, the problem with skipping episodes is that you're going to miss things. You're going to miss nuggets, gems, insights, which could make a real difference in allowing you to get the job and to change your life. Now, for example, unless you're looking for a job in property, you might not have been drawn to my interview with Rob Bentz in episode 36, where we discuss how to get a job in property. Now, that would be a real shame because it's crammed full of great tips which would help to impress no matter what job you're going for in no matter what industry you're applying to. Another example is my interview with Karen Kelsky in episode 29, which was about how to get a job after you've been doing a PhD. Now, if you're not doing a PhD, you might have skipped this one again, and you would have missed, again, some brilliant insights such as how to identify your skills, the mindset of job hunting, and why looking for a job is like dating. Now, all these are clips which I know you're going to enjoy. So since we've hit the half century mark, I thought it would be good to have a retrospective couple of episodes where we include some of my favourite clips from the previous 51 episodes. I've got such a wide range of guests that you might not have come across them before. See it as a job seeker's pick and mix, a greatest hits if you like, where I've taken some of my favourite choice clips and woven them together into a bit of a theme for you today. So let's kick off this cavalcade of stars. And if you listen to this, I guess it's because you want a job. But have you ever thought about your values? Yep, your values. Not sure exactly what I mean? I mean, I could explain it to you. But let me leave it to Jane Sunley, my guest from episode 25, who explains it better than I could. Jane, over to you. And link then to the to the happiness and being happy at work. Uh, how important then do you think values are in well, people's personal values um, in terms of the work that they should be doing? Um, two things, I think. First of all, it's important to know what your own values are. And people go, well, what does that mean? Your values are the things that are important to you in life, at work, and so on and so forth. So, for instance, it might be freedom. It might be having fun at work. It might be money. It might be having structure. So, as a simple example, if you want really good structure don't go and work in a small entrepreneurial business where everybody mucks in and it's, you know, quite unstructured. And ditto, you know, if you want freedom, don't go and work for a very, very structured environment because you're not going to be happy. And on my website, janesunley.com, there's a free tool which we will never hassle you or contact you or anything. It's just there to make the world a better place, really. But there's a, there's a free values tool that you can go and prioritize your values. It takes about 10 minutes or so. Um, and I think once you know what your own values and what's important to you are, then you can start to look for an environment or a company that aligns with your values. And it, it's almost like when you go for an interview, you're going to be interviewing them in a way as, as much as they're interviewing you. And those are the kind of things you want to find out. Will I be able to fulfill my own values within this organization? So, so important. And I will just mention that uh, when I do coaching and I, I do a manual version of what I used to before we had it online of, of, of eliciting people's values, the things that they think of last usually when we put them into priority order end up being on the top of the list. So it's not always in the front of your mind the things that really, really matter and that's why you need to sit and give it some thought. That's interesting. 
and um, the links uh, to the value uh, checker will be on the on the show notes so I'll um, I'll link to them Thanks. and um did it myself this morning and it was it was interesting it's I talked with James before we started recording one of the options that was um was uh, money or fun and I was looking at the screen thinking hmm, what am I what am I more interested in and it's um, you know it's difficult decisions like that because you can if you go for a job which might be the cool and great fun but if you're you know very low paid or not getting paid the two values might be then in compete um, in competition yeah. can can be difficult of course these things will evolve over time i mean you should probably do it once a year really because it might be that right now you're living at home with your parents so the money's less important so you go for the fun but it might be in a few years time you want to move out or you i don't know find a partner or you have a baby or whatever and then money becomes more important so i think it's important to keep reviewing this because it changes so once people have got their values and they know they're prioritized and they've got an idea of what their really uh, their core values are how then would they should they begin to start using them in their job search uh, well i think some people have a bit of an idea of what they want to know but i know an awful lot of people that have got their, what they want to do sorry an awful lot of people have no idea about what they want to do so in that case that's about saying okay there are my values now let me think about what i'm good at and what strengths i've got and what experience i've got and what, what i can do with it and i wouldn't get too hung up on the actual job title but then if you go and start to research companies you should be able to see from their websites and google searching them and all the rest of it what their values are you'll be able to see from the tone some of them great put them on the website fantastic big tick you should probably give priority to those companies who have defined their values and are out there saying this is what we're about this is what we stand for because it's quite easy then to say yeah i would really fit in there or do you know what i'm not interested in a company like that so if you can find a company that's quite transparent then that really helps um and if not as i say just look for the signs you know if you go on a website and it looks very very corporate and all the rest of it if that if that sort of those sort of values are, are in your skirt your value set then great go and work in the corporate environment if it's very cool and fun and a bit laid back and a bit funky and all the rest of it then maybe that fits your, your value set so it's very important to find an environment in which you can thrive and survive because you might be the best most talented employee in the world but if you're in the wrong environment you're going to bomb and that happens all the time and then people mm. lose confidence and it ruins their careers so think about environment thank you to jane suddenly as she said your working environment is crucial to being happy at work. You don't want to be working somewhere where you aren't happy. And it's best to try and figure this out before you start. So think about those values. Do check out her values tool where you can find the links to that and to her whole episode, episode 25, in the show notes for today's show, which you can find at graduatejobpodcast.com slash greatest hits one. So there you go. An appetizer on the topic of values. Still not convinced they're important? In that case, I'll hand you over to David Schindler, my guest on episode six. And I think values are really important about this as well, and some some other area that we, we haven't touched upon. But understanding what's really important to you um, is a really good compass for people. So uh, even if you don't know where you're going and, and what you actually specifically want to do, understanding the kind of uh, your own value set helps you to identify the kind of environment you want to be in. So for me, it's, you know, my, my family background and everything about me has, has been around equality, justice, fairness. So I, don't, I always, always wanted to be in, in, within an organization that cared about its employees, that did good as a, as a purpose, uh, and so on, because that fitted with my personal values. Uh, it, it affects the way I do business now with uh, other organizations because I expect certain standards of behavior uh, in business terms um, because of that whole um, value set, you know, and, and I will go the extra mile to help others and I kind of expect it in return, I suppose, in some ways. So, so yeah, standards and values, etc., are important to me. Principles are really important to me. Uh, that then affects the kind of places and people I want to work with. And as you mentioned at the beginning of the interview, it's that period of reflection that you have uh, transitioning from university to work where you can you know, begin to think about what it is that you want and the type of company that you want. And if you can do that thinking at the beginning, 
it's going to save you so much Absolutely. trouble and, and, down the line. And, and, it's, um, and you can get help for that. You know, you, you don't have to do that alone. And, and you know, I go back to, to what I do, which is, is helping people to think that through and to think about, okay, you know, if, if uh, making money is your number one value, you know, maybe that's the number one value you have uh, is to be as, uh, as wealthy as you can be, et cetera. But also your, another value you have is uh, family time. Which is going to come out on top if they compete. Yeah. So then you start to realise there's a pecking order with these values, and if you decide your family is more important than making money, then when push comes to shove and you've got to make decisions about jobs, careers, etc., that's the one that will win out. So as a typical example for for me, I I once got offered um, two jobs at the same time. One job um, was a consultancy job. And I'd got to gone through an assessment centre, and I'd gone to a second interview, and I was just about to finish the second interview, and I asked the question, uh, "What's the best thing about working here, and what's the worst thing about working here?" And the best thing was, "Oh, fantastic lifestyle, great colleagues, wonderful work." What's the worst thing? I didn't see my children grow up. Well, <laughs> so I, I turned that job down, and I went to another job which was less exciting, less interesting, but same pay, and re- allowed me to see my young kids at the time. But interestingly, as a result of going to that other job, within a month, I knew I'd made the wrong decision. Because actually, the value that I, I put higher than my family, surprisingly, was the nature of the work and what it would do for me. So rather than having a boring job and being able to go home five o'clock, what I wanted was a more interesting job with varied hours and a more exciting lifestyle. And I made some sacrifices. But that's that's the value decision you have to make. And as you said, it's about careers are an iterative thing. You you know, you you start in one and where you end up is not necessarily where you where you thought you'd begin. No, and, and I suppose that um uh, the other thing to say about that sort of non linear career et cetera is there are still some there is there is a pattern to to my career which is about identifying those things that have been common threads all the way through and as I said certain things to do with coaching facilitation analytic writing etc have been common all the way through they've just morphed into different shapes and different environments along the way and have been honed through practice and I think it's that kind of understanding of yourself and reflection you need to do throughout your career and when you're starting out you have to you have to start to pay attention to that because too many people get of, of my generation who've got to the other end of their careers and said i didn't pay enough attention early on and, and i've ended up somewhere i didn't want to be so listeners wise advice there from david about making the having those um, thoughts at the early stage of your career so you can benefit from it instead of looking back in anger when you get to the end Absolutely. Thanks again to David. There are no right or wrong answers when it comes to values. Each of will be very different and personal for you. For some of you, money can be down the bottom of the list and making a difference and helping people could be up at the top. For others, money and prestige and a job title where people go, ooh, could be up at the top. Now, one's not right and one's not wrong. My point is it's going to be different for every person. So have a think and see where they stand for you. I can give you the map to help you get a job. It helps, though, if that map is pointing you in the right direction in the first place. Next, let's stay on you, my beautiful listener, and continue to think introspectively with two clips looking at who you are and what your motivations are. The first is linked to values and is your why. What is it that's driving you forward? What is it that's going to help you to be a success at work? Let's join the UK's number one motivational speaker himself, the Northern Tony Robbins, Mr. Brad Burton. One of the things you talk about in your book quite a lot of, with having your own business is the importance of having a having a why, mm-hmm. having a reason that's going to get you up in the morning, you know, get you up when it's five o'clock in the morning and it's dark and get you out there and making making things happen. Yeah, oh, totally. And, and, and my why, I never had one. My why back in the day was to go and get stoned and, and party at weekends. That was my why. You know, that was my why, and I ended up living for those weekends where you look forward to it at 6 p.m., you know, and then the party's out until Sunday, and then you feel like shit until Wednesday. You know, that was my that was my why. 
back then. And then all of a sudden, family comes along. I mean, why now? It's about being sensible and creating, not a role model, because I don't consider myself a role model, but create a, uh, a home and a, a stable environment and, and a dad that the, the boys, I've got three, two boys and a young girl, um, you know, can look up to. And then she go, you know what? This is my dad and, and I, that's what I can be. Because once again, it, you know, in terms of my toolkit, I didn't have anything conventional to allow me to succeed. But if I look at anyone, if you think about um, any of your audience here, listeners, looking at what you've got in, in your toolkit, my toolkit was I was street savvy. I was, I'm a risk taker. You know, all these sort of things have been massive qualities that you can't sort of teach them on. And I think I've used every, every element of what I stand for. And the fact is you and I are talking now doing, doing, doing this interview. You know, 10 years ago, I couldn't have done this. But what's happened over the last 10 years, I've built that experience up. I've built that experience up and I'm now climbing myself. See, 10 years ago, I was great at chatting girls up. Fabulous, right? Great at chatting girls up and making joints and, and getting stoned. Not so good at it now, to be honest, because I'm married and I'm behaving myself. But what I'm trying to say is whatever you focus on, you apply it. And this is the thing, if you've only got a, like a like bandwidth, if you've only got bandwidth in terms of what, what you're applying your bandwidth to, are you applying your bandwidth to being Mr. Cool when you go out on weekends? Well, that's great. But you've got less bandwidth to apply yourself at being good at business or good at jobs or whatever it is. So you've only got 100% of resource. You need to define it like your computer game. You need to define where you apply your resource. And right now, I think I'm applying 50% of my life to business, 50% of my life to family. I think it was as, as uh, the, the equilibrium was probably 85% business, 15% family um, as recent as three years ago. So I managed to get that balance right in my, in my life. And when I say uh, balance, what I do is, is I do what I want when I want. That's the reality of it. So, so if I can't be asked working, I won't work. I'll go and play computer games. If I want to work, I'll put the computer games down and go and work. So I'm working at optimum performance with everything. Whereas when you're employed, you've got to sit there till half five pretending to work. You know, quarter past five, thinking fucking hell, 15 more minutes to go. Tap 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 tap. Only five more minutes to go. Just pretending to work. What a waste of everyone's life. Waste of employers' time. Waste of your life. But that's what we do in, in this world. So my why. Is to make a positive difference to my family. It's also to take my kids to Disney World. I take them to Disney World every year. We're on a wonderful holiday there. And that's like, when you think working class lad, Manchester, no one want to go to Disney World on these 18 day, 21 day vacations. 10 years ago, how would they have managed to do that? It would have been, you know, it would have been okay for everyone else who was there. But somewhere along the way, the decisions that I've made, that I've made, have brought me to the position where I can do just that. A couple of things stood out for me from this. What is your bandwidth used for at the moment? Are you applying all of your bandwidth for going out and looking for jobs or is it just something you do when you're not going out with your mates and partying? No matter who you are, everybody only has 24 hours a day. So make sure you are focusing on what's important for you. Also, why is your why? What is it that's driving you forward to get that job? Is it strong enough to keep you going as you might get some rejections along the way? If not, is it you or is it the job? If it's not the right job, it might not be driving you forward. Food for thought. Check out episode 20 for more from Brad. And if his message resonates with you, do check out his free books, including Get Off Your Arse and Get Off Your Arse Too. Next. Next is Jennifer Holloway, guest from episode 12 and the author of Personal Branding for Brits. In this extract, she discusses your personal brand and why you need to be true to yourself as you look for work. And as you talk in the book as well, you can't please all of the people all the no. time. No, and and you'll, you'll make yourself loony trying, quite frankly. It's about that the reason why you get yourself to that knowledge of here's my brand pyramid, here's the best version of me, is so that you have a sanity check to know that that is what you are going out there and selling. So it, the best example I can give is this years ago when I was when I was making these train journeys and working on my brand, I got myself to a final pyramid. I then and this was in the extremely early days of my business back in 2008. After I knew what my own brand was, I emailed a whole load of people I'd worked with, my ex CEO, some of my earliest clients, people who'd worked for me and just asked for some feedback on my brand. And I got a bit of feedback from someone whose comment was, Jennifer, the thing about your brand is it's double espresso, but sometimes I'd wanted tea. Now, at the time I got this feedback, I'll be honest with you, 
wasn't exactly in the best frame of mind and got somewhat upset thinking oh my goodness this person doesn't like me and I'm, I've been too over the top being described as double espresso I've been too in your face and I've obviously been too opinionated and I didn't even know he wanted tea so obviously I'm not good at listening and I had a real crisis of confidence and my initial thought I'll be honest with you was oh my god I need to become more tea I need to tone things down I need to be calmer I need to be gentler I need to listen more and it was all I need to change I need to change but then I slept on it and I woke up the next morning and I reread this email and I thought hold on here a minute I've spent a month on a train working out what my brand is this person has called it double espresso he's right my brand is double espresso it's quite full on it's quite in your face you know if, if people see my I always have bright red lipstick on bright red nails I have quite a you know a, an expressive way of talking I'm double espresso it's not up to me to give this person tea at the same time. You wouldn't go into Starbucks and say, hey, could I have a double espresso and can you put it in with a mug of tea? No one wants to drink that. And I just realized then and then, not everybody's going to buy my brand, but the people who want coffee will, and the people who want tea won't. And that's fine. It's much better that I am the best coffee I can be than I try and become tea and I'm really bad at it. Excellent point. And one of the VPs I used to work with when we were bidding for work, his philosophy was we either want to be first or we want to be last. So a lot of people aren't going to like what we're yeah. selling, which is which is great. Yeah. They're not for us. But a lot of people, they're going to love it. And the worst place to be is in the middle. I, I agree like, oh. completely. And I think go out there. The thing is, if say you go for an interview, you're a graduate and you go for an interview and you are 100% yourself, the best version of you that you've worked out on your brand. If you put that out there and you're saying, hey, here's what I'm selling, and you're very clear about it, you are giving people the information they need to decide if they're buying. The people who are on the same wavelength as you will read all the clues you're giving through how you sound, how you look, how you speak, everything, and they will love that and they will buy it. Some people will sit there, they'll read all the clues you're given and go, that is so not what I want. But that's fine because, do you know what, even if you got the job, you were never really going to be happy working for that person because you're on an entirely different wavelength. So put your brand out there honestly and let the people who are looking for it find it. You know, I have been, that guy did me a huge favor saying to me, you're double espresso because I use it as shorthand now. So when I, I recently redesigned my website, and in my head, it's always, is it double espresso? Is it double espresso? When I write a blog, am I being double espresso? When I buy an outfit, am I, is it double espresso? And it's like, yeah, because I need to be consistent. If I think I'm veering into tea, I suddenly stop and think, oh, no, hold on a minute. That's not my brand. So it's, it's so great, as you say, be one thing. It's, you know, the Marmite effect. You know, you either love it or you hate it. Well, Marmite's an incredibly successful product, so it must be working. I love that clip. Now, thinking about your brand isn't something that's very easy to do. It doesn't take two minutes, but it's why you should do it, really, because not many other people are going to do it. And if you take the time and spend the time thinking about what your strengths are and what your brand is, it'll help to crystallize your thoughts on exactly what it is that you should be applying for. Now, check out the episode 12 for more details on exactly how you can go about doing this as Jennifer takes you step by step through the detail of how it's all done. Moving on, you've thought about your values, you've got your why and your personal brand. Now you need to take control. Over to the career guru with the velvety voice, it's John Lees. Start of episode 16 and 44, with a clip from his first appearance on the show. Networking also plays into um, one line from your book that really struck me, uh, which was, whatever your career stage, it's vitally important to be active rather than passive mm. in your job search. Yeah, that's, um, that's true. How, how, um, how can people take on that um, being active? And um, you talk in your book about you know, creative career management. Well, um, and that sounds fancy, doesn't it? But what it really means is taking control of the levers for yourself and understanding that you, you actually improve the odds by doing so. So if you're passive, what you tend to do is to use um, job boards or apply to um, advertise vacancies. And, and they're often known in the marketplace these days as candidate magnets. You know, in the graduate marketplace, uh, and an interesting advertisement in a national newspaper or even an online one for a graduate role, they can easily attract a thousand people. So your chances of getting through, even if your CV is brilliant, are, are very, very slim. 
Sometimes they also put their hands, themselves in the hands of um, recruitment agencies without really understanding how you have, that's a relationship that you need to build and you have to have fantastic clarity about what you're looking for. So the other side of the coin would say, well, what happens if you are active is that you understand that reaching out to people to discover what's out there, and I'm going to... Um, really want to emphasize that you don't call it networking. Change that word in, in your brain to something more like interesting conversations, uh, face-to-face re- research, um, finding people that are interesting. It doesn't really matter what you replace it with. As soon as you do that, what you're actually doing is making yourself visible to a very different kind of job market. Um, so, And that is when people say, I was lucky because uh, and I just met somebody. Well, you don't just meet people, but that, that kind of happens because you're looking and you're out there. And, and certainly when the phone rings and says, here's something that you might like to look at, here's an opportunity you could be interested in, that's probably because of something you've done actively. Um, active active behaviour sometimes means direct approaches to organisations, uh, but it generally means telling people what you're looking for, reaching out, making sure that uh, what limited time you have available that you are talking to people face to face. That's true. And uh, again, it's only as I've got older that um, begin to realise just how big the hidden job market is. Um, so after university, I applied to um, my focus was on the, the big graduate schemes mm. and uh, the big online applications mm. um, without really thinking that. 95% of the other jobs mm. were out there and it's about you know, making connections and speaking yeah. to people. Well, that's really interesting, that, James, because I think that the, um, that's such a common story that you know, re- people have pretty good degrees, they apply for those schemes uh, and they don't get, much, don't get very far and they don't get much feedback. So that's off-putting anyway. And then what they tend to do is kind of gradually work their way down the scale very fast to taking uh, fairly low-level jobs. Um, so it easily becomes, well, uh, if I can't get the difficult thing, I'll just do the easy thing. Now, the problem with taking a low-level job is how long you're going to stay in it uh, Mm -hmm. and and what that actually does in terms of shaping your CV. Um, So a a mid-range compromise might be to say, well, that's the obvious route. What's the less obvious route? And again, this is where talking to people helps because... You're not saying, give me a job or tell me where the job vacancies are. Often what you're doing is finding people who studied uh, two or three years before you and saying, tell me your story. How did you get there? Uh, who should I be talking to? What other organizations are out there? Yeah, so it's, it, it does make a huge difference. And you really have to watch out for this kind of um, um, you know, the rules of the game are not working for me. So I'll lower my sights to the bottom level. And uh, you talk in the book about A to Z thinking, so just uh, make sure you see that. Perhaps um, I'd better explain what A to Z thinking is. A to Z thinking is kind of the thinking we use for project management. Um, the problem is in a, in a diverse and kind of chaotic uh, job market where things are being created and lots of jobs aren't advertised, you can't just sort of say, well, I'm going to set my sights on that role and that organisation and work towards it like I'm managing a project. Um, a better metaphor would be you're going to probably have five or six career ideas and, you, and these are plates that you're going to have to spin, uh, and even without necessarily saying that's the perfect answer. Five or six is great because you, you, it means you're constantly having to say, who do I speak to next? What, what do I follow up? What connections can I make? What bits of research do, do I need to do? And, and you know, even with somebody that says, well, I'm really busy, I'm in my last year at university, I'd always say to them, well, if, if you only find half an hour a week to do some of that, then get the maximum leverage out of that half hour. Thanks to John. As he said, speaking to people really is the secret. And to take us into this in more detail is career coach and author Richard Morn. And moving on to secret number two, I know this is something which strikes fear into many people's hearts, including my own. Um, Richard, would you like to enlighten us on number two? Uh, yeah, I, I would do. It's very simple. Again, this one begins with an N, and it's networking. So it's enough for networking. And um, the reason for going for this for number two is there's a massive secret job market out there. You know, 95% of jobs are not advertised. They go to people who know people who know people. So if you're looking at a newspaper and there are 100 jobs in there, there'll be another two or 3,000 that you won't get to hear about. And networking is the 
the skill that enables you to find the opportunity. Mm. The other thing about networking that people overlook completely is if, for example, I'm talking to you, James, and then you meet someone tomorrow who says, oh, I'm looking for a business coach, and you say, oh, I know this guy called Richard Moore, and he's really nice, he's really really passionate about it, then you're already selling me in, and that client will overlook that I may not have a particular qualification or particular experience. So networking allows you to be sold at a human level, you see. So it's, it, it, that's the double hit with it. You find the job, and you get sold into it. So from a graduate point of view, if you're recently graduated from university, yeah. you might not have a particularly large network outside of your peers at university yeah. and, your, and your friends. Mm -hmm. How can you go about starting to network so it's effective in your job hunt? That's a great question there, James. Effective networking starts off by making a list of people you know. So if you know your family, they will know people. It's very tempting to think of mum and dad as being sort of grey-haired old fogies. It could be, though, that your, your, your mum knows the chairman of a local organization. Um, so I always say start with people at home. Then think about your relatives. Who, do, who, who are they? Where do they work? Who do they know? Then think about your, your immediate peer group. Who are they? Who do they know? That immediately gives you about 15 to 20 people you can go and talk to. So networking is about talking to people, and it starts with talking to your, your immediate family, your uncles and your aunts, for example, sake, and saying, I'm looking for a job. Who do you know who? That's the most valuable question. Who do you know who, who might be able to help me? Not, can I have a job? It's who do you know? So that's the first thing is, is really to be methodical about it. It's amazing that you always know more people than you, than you think you do. And I always say to people, you can always email me and say, Richard, who do you know? And you'd be amazed how many people don't ask. So by asking, it gets you ahead of the game. The other thing you can do is be very practically minded. Look at your local community and think to yourself, where's a good place to go and, and um, talk to people? So there are local business clubs that meet. Um, you can go along to those as a guest, often for free. And even if it costs you 20, sort of 10 or 12 pounds a month to go along, you can, you can join them. And rather than turn up and say, I'm a graduate, I'm looking for work, you can say to yourself, yeah, I've done a marketing degree. I'm thinking of setting myself up in, up in business as a, a marketing um, consultant. And I'm just sort of feeling my way in the world and, and gathering information. People will be very happy to help you. And you've just met another 50 people that way. It's a um, famous saying, uh, your network is your net worth. <laughs> so the number of people you know. Uh, well, it's absolutely right. And you always know more people than you, than you realize. And people will, are always going to be more helpful. So the, so the first thing is, look to your, I'm, I'm not joking, look to your family and start to tell people that you're looking for work. The second thing is, look to your community and, and from a business perspective and go business networking. And the third thing is, volunteer. I have a radio show on a Thursday and we have a number of graduates coming into the radio show to act as producers and, and supporters and things. And um, I always say to them, you now know me and ask me, what do you want? How can I help you? And in fact, I've just got our producer a job because she had that conversation and said, okay, Rich, put your money where your mouth is. Then you're this careers guy. What do I do? And I said, you know, go and start talking to people. And of course, she's talked to people at the radio station. And lo and behold, she's been sat in the studio for the last 12 weeks with her future employer. Who do you know who? What a brilliant question. It's a question that I utilize personally when I ask each guest on the show, who do you know who would be good on the podcast? And from that, I get some excellent recommendations. If you take nothing else from this episode and only remember to ask this in your job search, then you'll be doing well. For more from Richard and his other two job hunting secrets, check out episode three. Next, we're going to go across the Atlantic for a clip from Karen Kelsky, author of The Professor Is In, and star of episode 29 where she discusses how to get a job following a PhD. In this clip, Karen shares a brilliant example of how you can begin to think about what you're good at. And how can they begin then to match their skills to the wider non-academic job market? Well, the first task is actually to identify your skills. And that's a challenge for people with PhDs because they have spent so many years among people with a similar skill set that your skills become very much taken for granted. The example that I like to use is I'm a Japan anthropologist by training. I lived in Japan for many years to do my research, and even prior to entering graduate school, I lived in Japan. And I'm fluent in Japanese. 
Um, as a Japan anthropologist, every one of my colleagues was fluent in Japanese. So you, we didn't go to conferences and brag. Well, you know, you know, I am fluent in Japanese. That would be preposterous. You never mentioned it. I mean, it would be déclassé to mention that. But if I had to make the transition out of the academy, suddenly my fluency in Japanese would become a very, very marketable skill, but I have to learn how to present it as such. And that's just one example. There are countless others. There's public speaking, there's writing, editing, statistics, uh, survey methods, interviewing, all of these skills. And I'm speaking from an anthropologist perspective. Those are skills we typically have. But no matter what your field, you have uh, you have all those skills. So the first thing is identify them, tally them, brainstorm, don't censor yourself, really free your mind, liberate your mind to realize how multi-talented you really are. If I could add one more point to add on to that, one of the things about graduate training is it constantly tells you what you're doing wrong and where you're lacking. It is a critique based experience. And the outcome of that is enormous insecurity. And you're very accustomed to thinking of yourself as what you're lacking. Well, I haven't really finished reading that book. <laughs> I haven't really finished chapter four of my dissertation. I haven't finished that article yet that I was supposed to get out. That's the world that PhDs live in. You have to overcome that negative self-talk and that negative self-image and reverse it. I am capable of speaking Japanese. I'm excellent at speaking Japanese. I'm excellent at statistical analysis. I'm an excellent writer and editor. These are not things we are accustomed to saying to ourselves or to anyone else. So that's the big obstacle for anybody moving from a PhD out into the non-academic world. Thanks again to Karen. What are the skills that you are taking for granted? What is your equivalent of speaking Japanese that you're so used to that you don't shout about it from the rooftops in the applications and interviews? Really pay attention to what you're good at. Ask for honest feedback from your family, from your friends, university colleagues, people that you've worked with. What they tell you might surprise you, as everyone has more skills than they think they do. And from the different roles, jobs, work experience, etc., you'll have more skills than you probably thought about. The secret comes from just spending the time to think about what they are and how you might use them. Next, let's go back to the UK now to speak to Simon Reichwald, Director of the Bright Future Society, for a sobering view on the graduate job market at the moment. Now, if you think you've got two one and it's going to be good enough to get a job, then you definitely want to listen to this clip. You talked there about the large numbers of people getting two ones and, and firsts. How would you recommend that people getting in touch with you uh, look, seek to differentiate themselves on their CV or application? Yeah, I think it's a fantastic question. And I think it, you've hit the nail on the head, James. It is about differentiation. Because the, the, the brutal and sad truth is that academic achievement is no longer a differentiator. Now, 20 years ago, it absolutely was. You know, if you've got a two one, you were one of a minority. Now you're one of a majority. You know, your A-level A-level points, again, you know, if you had 300 UCAS points or so three Bs, you would be in the minority. Now it's the majority. And, of course, the other interesting thing that happens, a growing number of companies are dropping UCAS points as a criteria for application. But anyway, that's just probably a topic for another day. But the point is academic achievement will not differentiate. Relying on that is a dangerous tactic. Now, don't get me wrong. It's important you do well academically. But, and as well as you can, but it's not a differentiator. And, increase, and also, sadly, work experience isn't a massive differentiator because, again, students are just smart and you're catching on to the fact that you need to get good work experience. So, you know, work experience matters too and it will begin to differentiate you, but it will not uniquely differentiate you. Increasingly, what we are seeing is employers are looking at what else have you done over and above the obvious stuff you do at university. And that's where, they're, and they're looking for evidence where you have taken the initiative to do more. And that can be in all kinds of different things. That can be volunteering, it can be charity work, it can be obviously getting involved in, in clubs and societies at, uh, at initiative membership level, but obviously in time at a committee level, you know, like the Bright Future Society. Uh, so it's evidence of where you have taken the initiative to do more and achieved in that environment. So again, it can be achievement in sport or music, or but they're just looking for 
where have you bothered to use your time in a way that's going to require effort and commitment from you? These are the things that begin to differentiate you, and these are the things that employers look for when they're looking at your application form, when they're looking at your CV, when they're doing those interviews. They want to know about what else have you done. They don't particularly want to focus on your academics. They'll be interested in it, but not going to focus on it because most people have got good academics. No, I completely agree, and you can see, you can see with how some of the big companies are starting to drop a uh, requirement for a two-one. Um, yeah. Just due to the people yeah, getting. It's, it's, and also, quite rightly, they've recognised that getting a two, you know, and, and this is a bit contentious, I appreciate, but getting a two-one in one subject is harder in inverted commas than a two-one in another subject. Or, but the most important one actually is that academic achievement is not, there is no direct correlation between academic achievement and work-based success. Now, that doesn't mean if you do well academically, you won't be successful at work, but what it does mean is if you haven't done well academically, it doesn't mean you can't have a highly successful career. And that's the bit the employers are interested in. That's why they're really focusing on you as the person rather than you as defining you by your... 2-1 or your 300 or 320 or 360 UCAS points. And I think that's a good thing because where the market therefore I think is moving is employers are much more interested in the person rather than defining the person by their academic achievement. And what that does I think is level the playing field much more for students because any student can take the initiative to get involved in all kinds of other things that university offers them because university offers you wonderful opportunities. And anyone can take part in that uh, and, and show that initiative and develop those skills and develop those capabilities and, and network with employers and find out what they want to do. So I think the way the market is moving and this move away about the, and the obsession about academics, and as I said, don't get me wrong, academics are really important in terms of don't think, oh, it doesn't matter then. It does. But more and more the focus is shifting towards you as the person. And I think that's a really good thing. I completely agree. You can you can teach skills, but you can't teach someone an attitude. No, you can't. 100%. Thanks to Simon. For more from Simon, check out my chat with him in episode 26. Again, all the links from everything today can be found at graduatejobpodcast.com slash greatest hits one. If that clip scared you, don't worry though. If your time at university was spent with just a few lectures and lots of bottles of Glenn's vodka... It's never too late to begin to get that work experience, whether through volunteering, working, part-time, whatever it is. It's just up to you now to make it happen. So there we go. That's a quick canter through part one of some of my favourite clips from the first 50 episodes. Stay tuned though, as next week we cover extracts giving you amazing advice through each stage of the application process to ensure that you are a success. If you do like these shorter nuggets, make sure you check out my YouTube channel, which has over 150 short videos for you to enjoy. Get in touch at Twitter at GradJobPodcast, or drop me an email at hello at graduatejobpodcast.com. Let me know your thoughts on the episode. What's been your favourite clip? Which one really stood out for you? I love hearing from you, so do get in touch. But without further ado, regular listeners will know that I like to finish each episode with a top tip for my guests. In that case, I'll hand over to Brad Burton with his final clip of a tip you can implement today to help on your job search. And finally, what one top tip would you uh, give to listeners that they can implement today? Be yourself, right? Be yourself. Because somewhere along the way, once again, go back to that bandwidth. If you're spending 20% of your time or 20% of your energy being something you're not to try to appease people or to, to, to make people happy or to, to be more employable, then guess what? You're only 80% you. And that means that actually you're failing. So my life started coming together when I spent 100% of my time being 100% me. And people don't like me for being me. Fuck off. I can not give two shits. My life's okay without those people. And the world's a big place. And people say, well, your style is not for everyone. Well, guess what? You show me one person whose style is for everyone. But we're all individuals. So why don't you just embrace that individuality and be you? On that bombshell, I hope you enjoyed the show today. But more importantly, I hope you use it and apply it. See you next week.